being rich isn't about what we have, but what we do. I love that. It's not about what we have, it's about what we do. Good morning, I'm Kellen Abreu. I'm the worship arts director here at Sloan's Lake Church. You're trapped with me all day in a room. We've uh, sealed the doors. We're going to talk at you for about six and a half hours. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we have our live stream going right now. Um, I know I always text my friends and family and let them know, hey, I'm speaking today, so you might want to hide my live stream um, from the church. No, I'm teasing. If you want to like, share, subscribe to our videos, um, tell your friends. Like, that's, uh, that's why we do the live stream. It's so those of us who maybe don't have a church that we normally attend or our friends who are in other parts of the country um, or our family members who can't be here today um, are able to also participate with us here in the service. So that's what our Facebook live stream is about. Back to my sermon. <laughs> Being rich isn't about what we have, but about what we do. Right now, my parents are living that. Uh, I don't know if any of you got to meet them while they were here a couple of months ago, but what they're dealing with right now is stressful to say the least. They've willingly taken a pay cut. They're both full-time ministers and their church is in a season of downturn right now. And they don't know what else to do to keep the ministry going. So they've said, you know what? We can't do this forever, but we can do this now. We can take this, we can do this right now. They've willingly taken a pay cut. They're still tithing and giving on their full salary, not on their reduced wages. And I was talking to them yesterday and I said, how do you find that in you to do that? And my mom's like, I'm just that's what I feel like God's telling me to do. Like she's like, I'm giving above and beyond financially as well. And sometimes it even is a double tithe and all this stuff. And I'm like, I can barely wrap my head around living on 90% of what I have. I can't fathom putting my faith and trust in God in that way. But that's what they're choosing to do right now. They're putting their faith, hope, and trust and still giving because God does not let them down. They're trusting in a God who doesn't let them down and who hasn't let them down for a good portion of our lives. We've lived, my family has lived just right at the poverty line for most, in the United States, not worldwide, but in the United States, we've lived at the poverty line for most of our lives. A lot of times growing up, we had rice and beans four or five nights a week. It's a complete protein, tasted good, I never complained. <laughs> That's why I make beans now a lot, and chilies and soups and things like that. But how incredible is that? To, to say, God, we, we trust you in this enough to say we're going to stick with this no matter the cost. And it's a steep cost. You're raising a family of five, that's a steep cost. How many of you know that's a steep cost, right? Yeah. <laughs> right now I have a family of four. I feel like, oh my gosh, we talk a lot about wanting to add more to that. And it's like, could we even afford that financially? I don't even know. <clears throat> They've tested God and God has not failed them. Would you guys turn to 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 with me this morning? And normally I have a physical Bible, but it's not with me this morning, so. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on a God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, Storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of what is truly life. And let's pause and look at 18 for just a moment. Instruct them to do what is good to, what's that next phrase? Be rich. Be rich. 
in good works, being generous, willing to share. It's not our finances or our possessions that cause us to be rich. It's our generosity. It's our good deeds. It's our good works. It's our willingness to incorporate. I I just want to take a moment and say thanks. We had a lot of people come out yesterday. I don't know if you know, but the church is Adventified, Christmasified. There's Christmas decorations everywhere. From my wife and I and, and a few others were here from 10 until about 6.30 yesterday. I mean, we had lots of other things that we were doing. We were cleaning out closets and working on sound systems and decorating and cleaning up things that hadn't, need, hadn't been done in a while or needed to be done. Um, and so I'd like to just give our, give our volunteers who came out a round of applause. Thank you, guys. It's tremendous. Your willingness, your willingness and your generosity with your time and energy, that, it, it astounds me. I mean, I, I get paid to do that. So <laughs> that's, that's not the only reason I'm doing it, but that's part of my job. Like that's, you know, is to give of my time and, and to be available. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth. When we have, we tend to put our trust in our possessions. Our jobs, our cars, our education, our houses, ours. We all, we all have that mentality. We all do. do. Does somebody not have that mentality? That what you have is yours? No, we all do. <laughs> Lee's wrestling with himself up here. In fact, this earth is not ours, it's God's. We're called to be stewards of this world. What is a steward? Come on, uh, this is a... Someone this, who takes care of something. Someone who takes care of something, like that. Any other, any other thoughts on what a steward is or what stewardship perhaps is? An owner. An owner? The steward of Gondor? <laughs> I could see that's where your mind went. The definition of a steward is to manage or look after another's property. Let's turn to Psalms 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. One of my favorite songs that we've learned together here is The Earth is Yours. I know. (laughs) I know there's several, I have several people come to me and be like, that's one of my kids' favorite songs that we do. And I'm like, awesome, that's great. I love that song. Holy is the Lord, the earth is yours, from the oaks and the cedars in the forest to the depths of the oceans, from the mighty mountains to the food-rich fields, the earth is yours, God. God's, Creation sees you and gives you everything it has. How much more should we have so much be willing to give back to you? The earth is ready to cry out and does. All creation cries holy to the Lord. We have so much. God has given us so much. We are able to steward what God has given us. And we can steward it well or we can steward it poorly. Creation sees God and gives everything it has. How much more should we, who are cognizant of what God has done for us, give back to what God has done and to who God is? Let's look at the parable of the talents. I'll give you guys a moment to turn to Matthew 25, 14 through 29. These verses won't be on the screen, so we'll read them together. Starting at verse 14 in Matthew chapter 25. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey 
He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. I feel like I'm that man sometimes. Somebody gives me something, I don't want to break it. I don't want to ruin it. So I might just put it aside, put it away, because I've been entrusted with this big thing, this big responsibility. Picking up at 19, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, and this this would be me. Master, I know you are a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. Here's what you got back. And his master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant, If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have at least received my money back with interest when I returned. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. The way I've always thought about this parable isn't in the physical sense. And it actually wasn't until Lee preached on this exact scripture a few months back where I put it all together, that this is a, this is a physical, financial, monetary thing. I've always viewed talents, I'm a creative, and so I've always viewed talents as what I'm able to do. I can do music, I can help with this, I can do this other thing. Like, I have many different talents. God gave me five, I've put them to work, maybe he'll give me five more. That's what my brain was always thinking. It wasn't thinking in the practical application of it. If I don't use my talents and abilities and instead choose to hide them or bury them or keep them to myself, I will lose them or have them taken away. This passage is so much less conceptual and is instead extremely practical. A talent is 20 years wage. For me, personally, that equals about $640,000. If I were to add all that up, that's what, like the price of one house in Denver? Maybe half a house in LA? So, maybe not even half a house, maybe like a shack in LA. Um, (laughs) Imagine an investor came to you and gave you 20 years of your current wage and said, here, invest this, try something, be bold. That's what's being asked. We focus on the, on the cowardly, wicked servant who did nothing. But what if we flip this on its head and say, okay, God, you're asking us to transform our lives and do something to live boldly, to be rich. Even if we fail, the effort in trying something is so much better and more fulfilling to our lives than living a life filled with fear, clinging to our possessions as if they meant everything. God's saying, here, I have given this to you. Do something with it. Live boldly. We get we get trapped. We get trapped in these these mental boxes and these mental walls that we create for ourselves. God's telling us to live boldly. To take our talents that He's given us, whether that be an actual physical talent, or whether that be a financial talent windfall or whether that be our time and energy. God has given us these things. He's appointed us as stewards over them. And all he's saying is live boldly. Do something. I don't know, but I'm guessing that if the man who was given five talents came back and said, Master, I tried something. It didn't work out. 
maybe I've got nothing left from that. All I'm seeing here in this scripture passage isn't, that's horrible. Because the guy who said, well, I got one thing, I'm going to bury it, I'm going to do nothing. He was called evil and lazy. The other, the other two who did something were told they were good servants. That's what, that's what we can be. We can, if we choose to use our talents, we choose to use our finances and our resources wisely, we will be good and faithful servants. I've spent so much of my life fearing failure. Failure as a musician, failure as a Christian, failure as a husband, failure as a father. Oftentimes I've failed to live boldly because I'm trapped in my own fear. God has an answer to that. Let's look at Malachi 3. If you will turn with me to Malachi 3, verse 7 through 12. And Malachi is one of those weird minor prophets, so I'll give you just a moment to find that. If you're using your phone, you're probably already there. If you're using a physical Bible, it'll take you a second. Since the days of your fathers, you have turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a person rob God? Yet you're robbing me. How do we rob you? We ask. By not making the payments of the tithe and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse, yet you're still robbing me. Bring the tithe of the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your field and will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a delightful land. God is saying, test this. Test God? That seems a little backwards, doesn't it? And I know you guys are super, super quiet because we're talking about tithes and offerings and contributions and all that stuff. It's okay. Loosen up a little bit. Come on. Shake it out. Shake it out with me. Come on. It's all right. I'm uncomfortable too. Trust me. <laughs> when I told Lee, hey, I'll speak on that Sunday, I wasn't thinking, what's this going to be on? I was thinking, hey, I'll just speak on that Sunday. Test God. It seems backwards, right? Yes. Yes, that seems backwards. It seems like God's testing us. Or worse, it seems a bit prosperity gospel. As in, okay, God, I'm going to give, but now you better give back. I'm donating my tithes. I expect that Mercedes. I don't even like Mercedes. I want all the classic V-dubs. Give me all the classic Beatles that I can possibly stand to have because I've given my tithes. That's not what this scripture is saying. It goes back, it goes back to what, the way my parents are living. They're testing God to be faithful and come through and provide for them in a moment. And that's how they've lived their whole lives. It, it scares me and confuses me. My, my parents have no retirement. They've got hardly two pennies to rub together most times. They live comfortably by the world standards, but by the United States standards, they don't. I don't know what the future holds, but they, they assure me and say, God's got us. We trust that. We've tested God time and time again, and God has never once let us down, Kellen. I don't know if I could live that faith-filled and that boldly and that confidently. What God's saying to us is that if we withhold our finance, our talents, our time, our energy from God, we're living under a curse. It's not just about money. It's a heart issue. We should be willingly and freely giving 
of not just our finance, but also our time and our energy and our heart. We should live boldly with those things as much as we live boldly trusting God with our finances. To live as freely and openly with my heart as I possibly could, that's a scary thought. Because I know that there's going to be some pain. I know I'm going to get hurt at some point. But I have a strong tower and I have a rock to return to. Jesus is that. That's the point of being rich. Live boldly in these ways. Trust God. God will take care of us. Everything we have isn't ours. It's God's. I'd like to close with a thought from 1 Chronicles 29, 13 through 15. All of these scriptures and series notes and sermon notes and other things can be found in our journals. There's still a few in the lobby. If you don't have one, I highly recommend picking them up. Um, it's been real enriching for me to go through this. Knowing that we're, we're joined together with so many other churches and believers, that, that just makes my heart swell. So if you, if you don't have notes, you don't have devotional materials, that sort of thing, there's even like recipes in here, and I was looking through it the other day. I know I'm sidetracking. I'm sorry. You know me. Just go with me. Um, but it was like, hey, I, I actually make that for dinner quite frequently. So there's good stuff in here. It's not just to feed your spirit. It's also to feed your physical form and promotional materials for the journal. <laughs> First Chronicles 29, 13 through 15 says, now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise, your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your own hand. God, we're stewards. Guys, we're, we're just stewards. We're aliens and temporary residents in your presence as were all of our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow gone so soon without a trace. Now that isn't mean, meant to seem hopeless. Instead, that's an encouragement to live boldly. Our lives are a boop, little blip. Seriously. Depending on, what, depending on what school of thought you come from on how old our planet is, either way, what, what's our 80 to 100 years? It's boop, just a little drop, a little blip on the radar. That's all. So why not live boldly? Why not give generously? Why not be generous with our hearts, with our time and our talents? Why not be generous with our finances? When you see a need rise up, why not say, I can meet that? Why not? What's holding us back? All we're doing is giving to God what is God's. We're not, we haven't manifested this creation to then give back to God. We're not Cain. Cain's, Cain's issue in Cain and Abel, to me, wasn't that he brought the fruits of his labor. It's that he was arrogant enough to think that that's what mattered and that he created those things. That's not what God was saying. God was saying, bring me an offering. Know that I have given you this. If your priorities are not in order with your finances or your time or your talents or your generosity or your energies, then I urge you to come to the altar today. Bring it before God. Really think about that for just a moment. Are your priorities out of order? If they are, there's a place to pray. Bring it before God. Test God in this. Allow God to be your priority. Put Jesus at the center of your life and see the fruit, the hope, the peace 
the love and joy. Let that, let Jesus begin to flow through you and flow through your lives. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear God, we, we thank you. And we ask, we ask you to check our hearts. God, we, we are a people who understand that we are but stewards of what you have given us. God, and we ask you to help us live generously and live boldly with those things. God, that we wouldn't be trapped in a box of fear but that we would be vessels of who and what you are. That we would take the hope, peace, love, and joy of this coming season to the rest of our world and our lives. God, we ask for a heart correction. God, if our hearts and our priorities aren't centered on you, we ask that you would correct that. And God, sometimes that work is painful. but we're trusting you in this. You've not let us down. You've not let me down, despite my own failures and fears. God, you've not let my parents down for most of their lives, despite their questions and their doubts. God, we're so grateful for what you have done for us. And we just ask that you would transform our lives to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with us, church?